In Plato's ideal state, the wisest amongst the populace would be selected to rule. These rulers, who could see beyond the shadows to glimpse the light of truth, would be trusted to make choices to the benefit of all. The gender of these leaders, said Plato, was not to matter, despite him labelling them the philosopher kings. That ideal was never realised, but the conversation started by Plato and his contemporaries inspired what many think of as the birth of Western philosophy. The central tenets being the nature of reality, truth and knowledge, how to live the good life, and most importantly, the practice of prudence and the pursuit of justice. To the ancient Greeks, prudence and justice were personified as females. The term philosophy itself contains the Greek word Sophia, meaning wisdom, which was also personified in the female form. It is thus a great irony that much of the history of philosophy has focused on the achievements of men, at its lowest points using its own intellectualizing to oppress women. Prudence and justice seemed only to exist for men. However, there have always been women concerning themselves with the big questions, seeing beyond the darkness and shadows that kept their society stuck in the male-centric thinking. Now, more than ever, there are people dedicated to pointing the spotlight on women's ideas, women's lives, and women's achievements. Rebecca Buxton and Lisa Whiting call them the Philosopher Queens. Hello and welcome to episode 92 of the Pan Sidecast. I'm the lead singer of everybody's favourite peacetime quartet, Mr. Jack Symes, and I'm joined once again by the man tearing up the floorboards in the hope of discovering our faulty concepts, only to find his wife's stash of anti-Kantian literature. It's Mr. Andrew Horton. <laughs> Hello. The man disappointed to hear that virginity is not a sign of virtue. It's Mr. Ollie Marley. Hello. And the philosopher queens, Rebecca Buxton. Hello. And Lisa Whiting. Hi, lovely to be here. It's great to have you both on the show. We've been keen to have you on for so long. And unfortunately, COVID's pushed this back, what's maybe a year now, but it's great to finally have you on. And the first question we ask all of our guests is, what is philosophy? In the book, Ellie Robson discusses Mary Midgley's idea that the job of philosophers is to tear up the floorboards like plumbers, find our faulty concepts and fix the problem. Do you think this is the right way to understand philosophy? I think that's a great way of understanding philosophy. So I work in political philosophy and moral philosophy. So this idea of using philosophy as a radical way of understanding the world and our place in it, I think is really important. I always really struggle whenever I'm asked what philosophy is. And Lisa and I have arguments about this to some extent. <laughs> but no, I think Midgley's on the money there. A lot of the philosophers in the book are concerned with the practical value of philosophy. Do you think philosophy does have practical value? Does it make progress? Can it impact people's lives? I think it definitely can. Well, at least I hope so. <laughs> so I work in a very practical area of philosophy, so I do political theory of migration. And whether or not any policymakers are actually going to listen to us philosophers is a good question. But I think there are definitely ways in which philosophy has hugely impacted the world. I mean, if you think about Aristotelianism in the whole medieval period, the entire system was built around a philosophy. So I hope it can make progress. Usually when we get things right as philosophers, it gets pushed into another discipline and we're left with all the stuff that doesn't make any sense. But I hope we can get somewhere. So I'm sure our listeners will be curious on the first philosophical texts that you read, the ones that were really interesting and inspiring. That's a very good question. Now I'm going back to sixth form, which is where Rebecca and I first started learning philosophy. And I think for both of us, we studied Plato's Republic for our A-level philosophy mm. class. And I think for us, that was a really formative experience. I think both in the way that the dialogues are written... And I think for me, this really goes back to the question of what philosophy is. And I think my view is that philosophy is really about asking questions about the world, about ideas, about existence, experiences. And I feel like the way Plato writes his dialogue in that Socratic style is one quite beautiful articulation of how philosophy can be. Um, and neither of us knew really much about philosophy at all before we studied it. So I think learning Plato's Republic first was a really interesting first foray into the world of philosophy and actually quite interesting that we've come full circle and we talk about Plato's Republic and the Philosopher Queens, obviously, in our book. 
Is it the same for you, Rebecca? Yeah, the first book I read, I think, was about a year before that, the first book I read, the first philosophy book I read. So I went to our local philosophy department in the bookshop and I bought Being and Time by Heidegger and Existentialism is a Humanism by Jean-Paul Sartre. And I took it to my philosophy teacher, having read it, and was like, what is up with these books? Like, I don't understand what they're saying. So I think I started with something much harder and extremely different from what I ended up doing research in. So yeah, Plato's Republic for me was the first big one. I think one book that I found particularly interesting, because at the time when I first studied philosophy, I would have definitely described myself as a Christian, as religious. And one of the books that my philosophy teacher gave me to read was Fear and Trembling and by Kierkegaard, which again, not the easiest book to read. But I actually think that was quite significant as well, going back to this question about does philosophy have real consequences in the world? Because I think I definitely found reading that book and subsequent questioning throughout A-level and subsequent philosophy at university, being able to question my own belief system and value system and finding that that Mm. in and of itself as a practice led to some shifts for myself, I think really did demonstrate that I think philosophy can be quite transformative to people. Mm. And they're not just abstract academic questions. They can also lead to changes in what we value and how we live our lives. At least some of the answers you've just given there probably anticipate what we're talking about next, which is that many of the philosophers that we speak to and many academics have intellectual heroes who inspired their journey into academia. Some of our previous guests, so Pat Churchill and said Francis Crick, Susan Blackmore said Jack Minot, Charles Darwin and William James. Kate Mann said hashtag no heroes, but gave Sally Haslanger as someone she admired. And Olivia Coombs named Gregory Miller and David Lewis. Is there anyone that you would consider to be an intellectual hero who inspired you into your love of philosophy? Yeah, I think I would have to go hashtag no heroes as well. (laughs) I didn't really have one philosopher. So I know some people have one person that they've read everything of that they're really, really interested in. And I've never had somebody who made me want to read everything else they'd ever written. I have a very long list of favourite philosophers, and Judith Sklar Mm. is one of those at the moment, the political theorist who is at Harvard at the same time as John Rawls, who's been unjustly forgotten. And I really like Thomas Nagel, who's one of my favourites, especially to read, and I think he's a fabulous writer. But I don't really have anybody. And I'm quite jealous of people who have somebody like that, because I would like to find them, and hopefully one day I will. Often people say when they ask Rebecca and I questions that we say similar answers or we always agree with each other, but I'm actually going to have to diverge on this one (laughs) and say I probably do have two philosophical heroes. I think the first one who is in the book is Mary Warnock. And I actually remember listening to a podcast interview of her when I was probably about 16, so right when I first started studying philosophy. And I found it really fascinating because she was talking about the work that she did leading the commission into fertility treatment in the UK and led this big bipartisan commission to wrestle with these different questions and try and set up some kind of regulation. But she obviously also did loads of other academic philosophy work, particularly on existentialism. And I think I found that combination of intellectualism and philosophy combined with a sense of practical ethics and practical wisdom and using her philosophy in her mind to make this difference in the world. She also did a lot of work on education as well. I found that combination quite inspiring to the point that I googled like, how to lead a commission, like a government commission, as like a job, which obviously isn't really a job that exists. But finding her life really interesting and inspiring is an example of that. And then I think my second one, who is someone that we briefly talk about in the acknowledgements of our book, is our sixth form philosophy teacher who I probably wouldn't necessarily describe himself as a philosopher, but the way he conducted his classes with us, which was very much around discussion and debate, I think for both Mm. of us was also very formative in really making us fall in love with philosophy as a subject. Well, yeah, we like praising teachers here. Don't worry about that. That's absolutely fine. Uh, So the two of you started studying philosophy together back in sixth form. You clearly kept up a strong friendship as well as an intellectual partnership. Beyond the inevitable Philosopher Queen's Volume 2, can we expect anything more from the Buxley and Whiting intellectual partnership? We've heard rumours of a podcast. Please don't put these three white guys out of a job. (laughs) Yeah, so this is something that we often talk about. I think it's fair to say that we never set out, like when we were younger, to be like, oh, one day we're going to become this philosophy pair that's going to take on the world. Um, It happened quite accidentally. I think it was mainly just the combination of our skills at the time. I had this idea and Rebecca was very organised and much more driven to actually see it through. So I think the combination of that was really helpful. 
I would love to work on more projects together. I feel like it's been such a wonderful experience. But we also have quite busy lives doing lots of different bits and things, between studying and working. And I hope that we can do something in the future, but exactly what it will look like, I'm not quite sure. Yeah, we've promised lots of people that we'll do things in the future. We have several <laughs> like long papers or essays that we're meant to be writing for things. But I think it's fair to say... We have a few other book ideas in mind, whether or not they'll come to be anything. I think as far as the second volume of The Philosopher Queens goes, we're definitely going to have to wait and see for another year or so whether our lives calm down. And part of that is because I think if we do a second book, it seems much more like we're trying to give a definitive list whereas the book was always just meant to be a taster. And there are loads of other amazing books on women in philosophy coming out in the next year and creating as much space as we can for those has always been our goal. So we'll wait and see if anything else happens. Part one. Women in Philosophy. So first of all, congratulations on what's been a very successful publication of The Philosopher Queens. You've obviously received an incredible amount of support from the philosophical community and beyond. The book's beautifully written and beautifully illustrated and it's full of insight. I think all three of us learned so much about philosophers we really should have been aware of before. And this is a historically significant text as well, isn't it? That it's one of the first of its kind. So what inspired you to take on this project? As we previously said, Rebecca and I both studied philosophy at university and we really loved it. But I think we were also quite conscious that it wasn't necessarily particularly diverse, particularly in the history of philosophy classes that we would take. We didn't have many female lecturers and we didn't have many women that we studied. So after university, we both diverged slightly and we moved to London and we had different jobs outside of academia. And it was during this period that I actually started working for the Human Fertilization and Embryology Authority, which was a regulator that was set up by Baroness Mary Warnock, the philosopher. Mm. And it really provoked me to start thinking more about how much of a shame it was that I didn't know much about women philosophers. And it would be really mm. interesting to still keep up philosophy as a hobby, something that I was interested in, but I really did want to learn more about women who had dedicated their lives to studying philosophy. So one day I had some holiday to take and I went into a bookshop and I was looking for a book on women philosophers and just went to the philosophy section and immediately was struck by the fact there was no introductory text on women philosophers, which I think to a lot of people seemed like a really obvious thing to exist. And I think over the last couple of years, we've increasingly seen rightfully women in science, for example, being highlighted and being encouraged to learn more about women in these disciplines that they typically haven't been particularly well represented in. And we also did find quite a few books called The Greatest Philosophers, which we skim down the contents page and it becomes even more obvious that there are rarely any women included. Occasionally you'd have maybe one, maybe two. And we found one book that was called The Greatest Philosophers, where not only was every chapter about a male philosopher, every chapter was also written by a male philosopher. So even more modern philosophers who were women were not being included or commissioned to write these books. So I, in haste, sent off a slightly angry tweet just to say that I was going to make a book called The Greatest Philosophers, where all of them would be women and all of them would be written by women. And mm. I mentioned this to Rebecca and she was like, well, why don't we actually make it? And I thought this was a ridiculous idea because why would we make this book when all these other mm. people could have made this book? And she rightfully made the point, well, no one has made it yet, so we might as well do it. And then she was the one that really pushed it forwards. Cool. So to take two examples, and there's one you give in the book, A.C. Grayling's a previous guest, his book History of Philosophy, it names only one female philosophy in what is a 704 page book. Nigel Warburton's Little History of Philosophy, probably the most popular history of philosophy book, dedicates just three of his chapters out of the 40 to women in philosophy. So we've got all these books for the general public describing the history of philosophy, and we've literally got one woman named in 704 pages. She's mental. It's crazy, <laughs> like the history of philosophy. So to solve the problem, we should identify the cause, right? Mary Misley tells us, tear up the floorboards, find the broken concept. Hey, these men aren't talking about women and all the books are written by men. But why do you think they're doing that? 
We need to know the cause to solve the problem. So why is it that these influential male writers are only talking about more influential male writers? <laughs> That's a really good, really difficult question to answer. I think in a way, the canon tends to sort of just replicate itself. And that in writing introductory books about philosophy, people will maybe rightly go and say, oh, well, who has appeared in an introductory volume before? And they'll just replicate, maybe change a little bit who's included, try to do something radical by having one woman in there as opposed to none. So I don't necessarily think that people are excluding women because they don't think that women have done philosophy before. They're being mm. excluded because they're not thought of as part of the core canon of philosophy. And it's that idea that there's like a central thread of philosophy going through history and they all just happen to be white European men. That's a real problem that we need to get over as a discipline. Yeah, I totally agree with Rebecca. I definitely don't think it's at the individual level that these people are prejudiced against women philosophers. I think mm. Rebecca's right that there's this very dominant narrative that there is this story of philosophy and we all know the big names that are included in that story. And I think that's been built through a variety of means. I think it's partly institutional in terms of how universities preserve certain knowledge and focus on certain people's work. But I also think there's a very strong stereotype around who is a philosopher and who counts. And I think that that leads us to certain conclusions about whose ideas are important and whose should be valued. And I think that's something that we certainly found in developing the book is we'd include certain women and people would question, are they really a philosopher? Do they count? And I think that kind of extra level of scrutiny that we provide to women that maybe we don't provide to men who are similarly situated in the history of philosophy is one of the challenges that we uncovered when developing the book. Mm. I'd be really interested then to hear what you would say to somebody, perhaps like an undergrad who just starts philosophy and they say it's all about the abstract ideas and that's the thing that's important. And they might say, well, then well, does it matter who says the ideas? Why does it matter that they're women, for instance, in this collection? What's the response you would want to give to a student who might go down that route? Yes, yeah, so I think there are a few responses that we would give to that because I think that's definitely something that we did encounter. People would say, oh, I just care about good philosophy. I don't care if it's a man or a woman. And I think the one thing that we would say is women do good philosophy too. Too, and they are worthy of study because they have done good philosophical work. And I think we can't ignore the fact that part of the reason why they have been excluded is because they are women. And I think to ignore that fact is to do them a disservice to the historical factors that have led to their marginalisation. So I think that's a really key one. I think there's something around actually correcting the intellectual record about the ways in which women have contributed to the history of ideas. Mm. But I also think there's something more important as well, which is symbolic, and that's not the primary motivation, but I think it is important not to ignore the fact that we create the history of philosophy in the narratives that we tell. And if we exclude women, that does also send a message to young women. And similarly for people of colour who are not represented in the history of philosophy in the way mm -hmm. it is traditionally told. And we're saying something about who is most likely to be considered a great philosopher. And both for their intellectual contributions, but also for the importance of demonstrating to young women that they too can be great philosophers, and they have been throughout history, is also something that I think is important. Let us pause for a moment to say a quick thank you to West Hill Endowment and all of our unsung heroes at patreon.com forward slash pansycast for supporting the show. In particular, a very special thank you to the man joining Boston's fine dining trouserless trend, Mr. Adam Cool. He pities the fall who plagiarizes the work of women in philosophy. It's Mr. T. He's not a philosopher queen. He's a very naughty boy. It's the life of Brian Ramirez. Playing a musical instrument over and over again until her fanboys leave her alone. It's Miss Lily Hooper. The patron saint of sexism. It's Saint David Legeness. The Philosopher Queen enjoying a San Pellegrino, it's Lou Sabarino. Breathing new life into the history of philosophy, it's Jamie Lung. Unable to steer philosophy towards a more inclusive curriculum, it's Jay Wheelus. And the man whose name history would never forget, Moran van der Kolk. If you're enjoying the show, then please head over to patreon.com forward slash pansycast to show your support. A link is also in the iTunes description. Right, let's jump back into the discussion. So we've just been touching upon this particular question then, and sorry, I'm going to be annoying and really try and pin it down. So what does it actually mean to be a philosopher? It's clear in the book, not everybody in the collection is traditionally a philosopher in the way that many people might imagine it. 
We try to take a very broad understanding of who is a philosopher in the book, and part of that is trying to push against this very sometimes exclusionary understanding of philosophy as only being done in universities, only having been done in a particular way. And of course, as women were excluded from those institutions, they were excluded from those ways of doing philosophy, so you have to sort of push against that a little bit. So we were saying in the introduction that philosophy just means love of wisdom. And I think anyone can be a philosopher. And people often who write novels are thought of as philosophers, who write poems are thought of as philosophers that we include in the book. My favourite understanding of what philosophy is, is from Friedrich Schlegel, where he says that philosophy is trying to be a systematic thinker without a system. And so it's just trying to find your way through an interesting problem about the world. So it's mm. much broader than the way in which we practice it in the Western European university setting. So the book is fantastic and it's full of a really diverse range of thinkers. But one glaring omission from Philosopher Queens is a chapter on the objectivist philosopher Ayn Rand. You know, we're <laughs> aware that the editing processes are tough. There's always chapters that don't make the final version. But it strikes us that Ayn Rand is more of a household name than some of the other 20 other chosen philosophers in your book. And what was curious, I noticed as well, she's not even in the list of the 80 plus more philosophy queens in your appendix either. <laughs> so the question then, is Ayn Rand a philosopher queen? And if she isn't, why not? Oh, that is a difficult question. I think in terms of the actual selection of women who receive chapters, this is something that we do get quite frequently, which was actually quite wonderful when we released the names of the chapters. Is that It turns out everyone does have their favourite woman philosopher. <laughs> <laughs> they were sad it wasn't included, um, which, is, which is really difficult because we would have loved to have included, obviously, far, far more women. And it does just go to show how many there are that you obviously can't in any way do them justice in merely 20 chapters. Mm. I think we made the decision not to include Ayn Rand, I think, for a few different reasons. I think firstly, because we did want to have a diverse range of women in the book, and therefore there are some names that are not as well known. And that is partly because it would have been easy to just include the women that almost most closely sit adjacent to the traditional canon. I and mean, that's why there are a few well-known names like Hannah Arendt and Simone de Beauvoir and Mary Wollstonecraft. And then I also think there's a wider question that whilst we don't personally agree with the views of everyone in the book, people have different philosophical views. And as I think Rebecca said previously, it's not a book of feminists, even though the book does have a feminist ethos to it. I'm sure some of the women in the book would have objected to either being included in a volume of this type or being described in the way that they're described in this book. But I think for us, it just came down to prioritising who we thought had something interesting to say. And we just didn't necessarily feel like Iron Rand fit with that in the book that we were trying to create. Not to kind of push you on this one, but one of our previous guests is called Sky Cleary, and she's got some very interesting opinions on this. And she says that philosophers love to hate Ayn Rand. It's trendy to scoff at any mention of her. One philosopher told me once that, quote, no one needs to be exposed to that monster. Many propose that she's not a philosopher at all and should not be taken seriously. She says, though, that the problem is that people are taking her seriously, and in some cases, very seriously. How would you respond to what Sky has to say there? Yeah, I think that has to be right. And that in failing to take her seriously as a philosopher or as a systematic thinker, we leave that up to the people who interpret her worldview and then use it in their political life. And if that's what we're really worried about, then we have to confront it in at least some sense. Lisa and I are probably among the group of people who like to scoff at the idea of Ayn Rand being a philosopher. <laughs> but this is just testament to the idea that the title philosopher is itself ideologically used. And that if we're trying to use it in this broad way, then of course she's a philosopher. Whether she's a philosopher queen, I think, is another question. But we haven't got a list of things that you have to hit to get that title. Yeah, I think that's very true. And I also think there's a difference. I don't think Rebecca and I would ever say we don't think Ayn Rand should be taught within a philosophical programme of education. And I think that that's an important distinction. I would definitely never go as far to say that people should be actively discouraged from reading and understanding her work, like you say, Ollie, because... She does have powerful ideas that are taken seriously by a large amount of people and therefore understanding those ideas is really important. It's just not something that we necessarily felt should be one of the 20 prized places within the book. In the introduction to your book, you say, the history of philosophy has not done women justice. One of our previous guests, Peter Adamson, is committed to exploring the history of philosophy without any gaps. When we spoke to him, he said, 
In antiquity, there was a self-perpetuating social dynamic where women were excluded from academic discourse in general, not just philosophy, but also the natural sciences and literature. If we compare philosophy to these other disciplines, we get some really interesting results. In 2021, books on female scientists and female poets and writers are numerous, from children's books to popular academic work. So I went onto a popular online bookstore, let's just call it River Rocks, and I got the most interesting search results. If you type in women in literature, you get 1,014 results. That's not too bad, sounds pretty good. If you type in women in science, you get 767. Not as high, but still not too bad. If you type in women in philosophy, you get 107 and yours is the top result. Do you think this is a problem with philosophy generally? Is it a boys club stuck in antiquity? Or is it just a little bit more niche than these other disciplines? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. I mean, I think philosophy, at least how I experienced it at undergraduate, is a boys club. And it still feels like a boys club. And Lisa and I are very outspoken, loud women as far as it goes. And so I didn't mind going into seminars and having really quite serious arguments with nine boys just against me. And I think part of that is because... So there's this really interesting study that Lisa and I talk about when we do presentations in schools on women in philosophy. And the study asked people in different disciplines, do you think you have to be a genius to succeed in your discipline? And philosophy came out really high. The, a, a very large percentage of people in philosophy think that you have to be a genius in order to succeed in philosophy. And that means it's really difficult to push against the sort of dominant narrative of who is a philosopher, because it makes it seem like you can't get better at it. You can't teach people how to do philosophy. So the barrier is not only up, but it's really solid. <laughs> um, it makes people think that they can't join. In the UK, about 50% of undergraduate students in philosophy are women. And the drop-off happens after undergraduate. So it's not about getting more women into philosophy departments to study philosophy. They're already going and doing really well. It's about why do they want to leave when they finish their undergraduate degree? What are we doing in these departments that makes them not want to stay? So yeah, I think it's a really good question. It certainly feels like a boys club to me. Well, you put this in the book, don't you? I've got a quick quote here. More women are taking degrees in philosophy than ever before, with most universities now seeing higher numbers of women than men in their undergraduate classes. So in a sense, philosophy has never been better for women in philosophy because we've got more women than ever taking undergraduate courses. So there seems to be a tension here between Grayling just talks about men. We go to A-level classes. We love the subject. We read about men. We study men. Yet we're still inspired to go and study this at university. So is it the lack of role models that are actually putting people off? Or is there some other reason? I'm going to start sounding like a right-wing commentator here. <laughs> well, I'll try not to. I think, Lisa, you've mentioned in the past in some of your interviews, you've said when you go into schools with Rebecca, one of the things young women are particularly worried about is people like Blordham Bleaterson. <laughs> and he's online telling people that the reason why women don't have the jobs they want is because they're family orientated rather than career orientated. So that would explain, says your favorite right wing commentator, why women take undergraduate courses and then decide to do something else afterwards. Any sympathy at all? For this view? Is there anything to it? <laughs> I think their first response to that, I find like that argument is just debunked by the fact that, like, why would women go and study philosophy for three years at university if they didn't really take it seriously as an academic interest? And I don't think there's anything, at least there's no evidence that I'm aware of, that there's something over that period that, like, naturally women just decide to reprioritize their family over their career or their academic studies. So I think for me, there's still a very open question about why does that happen? And it's really hard, I think, because we have so little evidence that it feels like any explanation is quite speculative. Is it about the experience people have while studying? So as Rebecca said, because the experience in tutorial classes feels combative and that isn't necessarily a supportive experience. Is it because young women think of who are the greatest successful philosophers? Oh, I don't look like any of those. Whether that's explicit mm. or implicit questions whether they can go on to succeed in a subject that we know is very unstable as a career choice anyway, but potentially you feel like you have to be even more at the top of your game in order to succeed and whether that difference feels like it's enough to put people off studying it. There are so many questions, but I think as we've discussed, 
it is a really significant problem. And I think we do need mm. to take it very seriously, this question of is philosophy a boys club and how do we encourage women to take it up? And I think we're going to have to dig a lot deeper to uncover some of those questions. Just to push you on it, because I think this is obviously one of the main reasons for the book and one of the biggest problems we're facing as philosophy as a discipline at the moment. So we've got, let's say, around 50% of undergraduates being women in philosophy. And then professors in the US, I think you cite a study, maybe it's 2016, around 25%. So we lose around 25% of those women between undergraduate and finally getting that quote-unquote stable job at the end of the path. <laughs> What happens when someone says, hey, that's not a massive drop off. It's just half of them decide that they have other priorities. Let's say for sake of argument that some of them do pursue a family orientated goal or something. Then some of them, this is a quote which doesn't sit well with me, apologies. When they discover they need to dance on the head of a pin to get a job, women conclude they could be doing something much better with their lives. Does some of it come down to choice? Does that explain the 25%? I think some of it has to be choice. Lisa and I, well, we originally left philosophy at undergrad. So I went to do a master's in refugee and forced migration studies at Oxford, partially because mm. I was frustrated with not feeling like I was able to do anything in the world. And I wanted a skill. And I wasn't sure that my philosophy degree had really given me anything. Like I was seeing my friends graduate with law degrees and go off and do all these amazing things. And Lisa left as well to go get a job in policy for, I think, similar reasons. So we were part of that frustrated group of people. We often get asked whether there's a similarity between the women philosophers who are included in the book, whether you can say anything about all of them. And I'm always really skeptical of the view that women in philosophy have a shared thing about them anyway that makes them make certain choices. But certainly what they do have is a shared history of exclusion from the discipline that they're trying to be in. And I do think that's really significant. My favourite woman philosopher through my whole undergraduate degree was Hilary de Putman until I realised that he was a guy. And I was really <laughs> genuinely, genuinely distraught. Yeah. And also Lisa and I well, I do political philosophy, Lisa does politics, government and policy stuff now, but also ethics and public policy. But at undergraduate, I was really into philosophy of mind. And that was my core interest. It was my favourite subject. It's what I did best in. And I think I sort of put myself off it because I was worried that as far as I could see, there were no other women doing it. And I didn't want to be the only one. Mm -hmm. Obviously, that's not true. Now I know. But also yeah. there was this expectation that it was like too hard for me or something. So I think there are these systems in place that make us think certain things, but we also convince ourselves that they're true because of the information that we're being given. And I think it's really hard to convince women out of that once they've got it in their heads. Yeah, I think picking up on the point around the choice is really interesting. It reminds me of a conversation we had a couple of months ago with Professor Anita L. Allen, who is both a writer of a chapter and also the subject of a chapter. And she was saying that she gets a lot of questions from her black students around whether they should study philosophy. And it really mm. struck me when she says that often now she will tell them to do law because she says it feels like it has more to offer them. And I wonder the extent to which that's professionally, but also whether it's something around feeling like they can do something in the world with that knowledge. And I think for me, it does link back to this question around the extent to which philosophy is both a private academic study, but also a societal study and something that mm -hmm. you can use in the world and also separate to it. And again, I really would not want to generalise because I think women study philosophy for all sorts of different reasons. But I think Rebecca's right. I think for both of us, the way in which we studied philosophy that potentially put us off made it feel like it was something very separate to the world. And we wanted to link it back into something that feels like we could use it for a social good, which is one of the reasons why we did the book, because we feel like it married those two things together in a way that we both really enjoyed. But I do wonder the extent to which making philosophy more accessible and highlighting the ways in which you can use philosophy to build relationships and to do good things would potentially change some of the demographics around the people that would be interested in studying it more seriously. Something that doesn't help us build relationships with our guests is Mystery Philosopher. The Mystery Philosopher. 
So you're going to hear the voice of a mystery philosopher, a philosopher from the past. She's been resurrected for a moment, and you've got to try and guess who she is. You may ask why I read Kant. For me, the question was either I study philosophy or I drown myself. I think that's Hannah Arendt. It's Hannah Arendt, yes. I could tell Rebecca knew who it was. It's from her chapter in the book, which is excellent if we haven't already said. But I was worried that no one would get it. And <laughs> Sorry, like, Rebecca. <laughs> it's in your chapter. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for listening for this installment of the Pansycast. The next installment's already available on Patreon. You can pick up a copy of The Philosopher Queens. There's a link in the description. It comes highly recommended by all of us. And we're giving away some copies on social media. So head over there to be in with a chance of winning. We'll see you next week. Thank you for joining us for another episode of the Pan Sai Cast. The next instalment of this episode will be available on the following Monday. Patreon subscribers already have access to the latest episode of the Pan Sai Cast. To support the show and get early access to all of the episodes, you can visit us on Patreon. That's www.patreon.com forward slash Pan The link is also in the iTunes description. For all the reading and to find out more about the show and get all of the old episodes completely free, you can visit www.thepansycast.com. From all of us here at The Pansycast, thank you for your support and thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much. It's been lots of fun. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for listening. Thank you all. I've enjoyed it a lot. Thanks a lot. You're very welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Goodbye. I really appreciate what you folks are trying to do. Thanks that was help. great. That was really good. Great. You guys really read up on this. Yeah, it was good. Wow. <laughs> that was a lot of fun. You guys uh, managed to combine the banter and the philosophy perfectly, I think. Beautiful. Fantastic. Great. Oh, well done, you guys. Gosh, you're yeah. doing a wonderful thing with this. <laughs>